Now, I might start with, uh, with the man who, who started first in the military, and that's uh, Jack Bell. Uh, and I do have to ask you, what actually were you thinking joining the uh, up as a gunner in the first instance, and what changed your mind to join the Air Force? Well, as you can imagine, 1936, it was a king and country, and we're all young bloods employed in various positions in Brisbane and the surrounding areas. Our pay was very poor. I think my pay then was about $44.80 a week, I think. And the opportunity came to join the, the army. So my friend and I, we went up to Kelvin Grove and joined there and they gave us eight shillings a day as a reserve military and trained as a, as I was trained as a gunner. Uh, and we had these 18 pound of cannon things that were drawn by horses. I was a driver on the horses, horse team as well. And we used to be able to go to Rosewood every year for a camp for 10 days, which meant 80 shillings, which was a lot of money. Now we could hit an anthill over, our focus point was Mount Warning, we'd over fire about 3,000 yards, we'd have spacing shots, and we could hit an anthill by the time we'd finished praying, training. So I said to my mate, as war was approaching, I'm not going to go stay in the army. I said, if you get shot like that, I'm going up near where it's going to be a poor target. <laughs> so that's why I left the army. They didn't want me to go. They, in fact, they refused to give me a discharge. I said, well, I've joined the Air Force, and I'm a volunteer, and I'm going to join the Air Force, and you have to give me a discharge. And they gave me a discharge 14 days before I was called up. Now, I, <laughs> I trained in Ballarat. Now, how did this all happen? There was about 45 to 50 of us came from Brisbane down to Sydney Central Station there. They all, from Victoria and Sydney, all lined up. And we all wanted to be pilots. So they'd lined us up in the station. They just called our names and said, your pilots, your observers, your wireless operators. And that was it. That's how we were called up. We had that. It was, so I was put on a train to Ballarat. And the first thing I walked in the gates at the Ballarat Showgrounds, which was cement floor, cast iron, galvanised iron roof and, and, and walls, you'll be sorry. <laughs> that was from the number one course. And they'd been there for a month. <laughs> and I agree, we were sorry. <laughs> because we didn't have any blankets coming from Queensland, where it was <laughs> nice and warm. We had one blanket given to us and a palliass of a, a three-sided bunk with a straw pallias on it. So we went to bed fully dressed, overcoats and all, and a blanket over the top of it. That's how we started training. Right, thanks, Jack. We might, uh, might move on to Peter. Um, so you're the, the middleman uh, in terms of timing in the war. Um, I, I've read and I've heard people talking about their experiences joining up, uh, particularly those who aspired to be a, a pilot. Uh, and in those days, that was probably a slightly unusual aspiration. And some of those guys hadn't even learned to drive a car, and they then aspired to fly an aeroplane. So what was it that, uh, that actually made you want to join up as a pilot? The main thing was that uh, I passed Myers in Burke Street, and in the window there was an effigy of an airman, and he was wearing a very smart blue suit <laughs> and I thought well if I'm going to join anything I'm going to join something that will make me look just like that fellow in the window <laughs> so I did but um, before doing so of course the first thing one had to do was to do a medical and we did the, I did the medical and then you got put on the reserve while you were on the reserve, you went to the local um, post office. And at the local post office, you did, I think it was, 20, was it 22, 22 lessons. You went every week and you did these lessons, which were uh, early, um, early mathematics and geometry and, and so on. And you did that until you were called up. 
I think it took about six months for while you were on the reserve. When you went on the reserve, you got a little lapel badge, and uh, that showed that you'd done something toward the war effort. Not very much, of course, because uh, all it meant was that uh, you were on the uh, on the list waiting to be called up. So we were called up and uh, and uh, I was sent up to Bradfield Park. And that was the start of my Air Force career. All right, thanks, Peter. And Murray, you, you were sort of towards the middle of the war. So what, what were your thoughts about George? Yes, well, uh, I always remember when the war started, my mother had some experience with the fellows who came back from the First World War, pretty rugged experiences. And uh, she was afraid for us. And uh, my older brother said, well, they won't get me. And I said, they won't get me either. And they finished up three of us joined up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you used to go to dances, and the girls used to make a big fuss of you if you joined up. And that was the main attraction, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little bit like Peter, I have to say. Yeah. Um, uh, before you go, um, I'll just say a bit more. So when we were at Mortley Marsh on the ATU, 21 ATU, the um, pilot and navigator and me were out by the main gate one day, and here's Geordie, one of our gunners, uh, coming towards us with his kit bag and his best uniform. Where are you going, Geordie? I'm not flying anymore, he says. And so someone said to him, well, what are you doing here, crew for? Oh, I'd a bed with a girl and get three stripes. <laughs> um, once, once you joined up and you started doing your, uh, your wireless operator course and getting involved in aviation, what was, that, what was that early flying like? Yes, well, we knew that when we joined Air Crew, we were very proud to have that white peak in your hat. Very proud. And uh, we were selected, and they saying at the time was they were the um, cream of Australia's youth, you see. And we knew that we were rather special. And we didn't know where we were going. But we knew that uh, we'd been selected and uh, our job was to put our heads down and go for your life and do as hard as you could to get through. So. All right. Thanks, Murray. Um, Jack, was it much the same with you once you actually started the, the, the flying part of the course and, and, and getting involved in aircraft? Well, we did very little flying at Ballarat. They had a couple of Ansons there. And I think I went up three times. It could have been four, but that was all. But one of my friends, he was supposed to wind in the area, which was about 400 feet flying behind the craft, and he didn't do it. So he was sent to a punishment camp in Sydney for a month. Now, I don't know how much that aerial was worth, but I got he, he didn't enjoy the camp in, in, in Sydney. He came back and he finished up as a wireless operator gunner, and he, he finished up passing out, I think it was course five, which I think was tremendous that he kept at it. Now, when you, when you left to go to the Middle East, how many, how many flying hours do you think you would have had by that stage? Say that again. Notice for, uh, for, for Jack. How many uh, flying hours do you think you might have had? Three, possibly. Four? Three. <laughs> Well, there were so many being trained. I mean, you got a, a term, but that was all. As long as you passed the test of, of operating the, the, the radio, that was it. Because you didn't have to fly the thing. You just well, you were a passenger. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll talk about uh, the aircraft you converted to uh, once you got there, but um, Peter, your uh, your initial flying experiences. Can you just describe that? Uh, as I said, I, my inclination would be to say you're an aspiring fighter pilot rather than bomber pilot, but you might have a view. Um, well, I did my initial uh, elementary flying at Narandra, number eight uh, elementary flying training school at Narandra. Uh, it took me eight hours to go solo, and uh, the weather uh, at Narandra was great for flying. It was good for cross countries. It was good for local, local flying. Um, the uh, worst thing that happened to me, of course, was I was flying around one day and I felt like a cigarette. <laughs> so I found a nice uh, paddock and uh, landed the aircraft. Was having a uh, 
quiet cigarette underneath the wing when somebody flew across. So I thought it was about time that I went back home. I did. I was uh, taken up before the flight commander. The flight commander took me up before the, the CO and uh, I got uh, confined to barracks for, uh, God knows, I can't remember how long, but it certainly uh, spoiled the uh, little romance that I had going with a girl in the, uh, in the town of Narandra. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but every question that Peter answers <laughs> makes him more like a fighter pilot in my mind than anything else, but, uh, but anyway. <laughs> um, Murray, your, your training as a wireless uh, operator, because it obviously um, sowed the seeds of interest for, uh, for subsequent life uh, in you, but yes. uh, what was it like? Well, uh, I've always been technically minded, and at uh, summers uh, we went to the ITS initial training school and we were asked, what do you want to be? And everybody said a pilot, and so I did I. And then I said, well, I've always wanted to learn about radio. Well, that was the king hit. That was it. So up to Ballarat and started the training. And uh, I kept at it. When you, uh, when you left to go to the UK, how many flying hours would you have had by that stage? Uh, well, uh, we had about uh, 50 at Ballarat and about 15 at <laughs> Sail on the gunnery course in the old ferry battles. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which fought in the Battle of France, they told us and still had bullet holes in them. <laughs> the old fairy battles. They were a terrible S machine. Sounds like you got a lot more hours than, uh, than Jack did. May I interrupt there? Yes. <laughs> I went to Evans had to do the gunnery course, and we had 16 fairy battles, and only three were serviceable. And like Murray's, they were full of holes. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you, uh, uh, where, where are we here? You would have um, finished your pilot training, Peter. Where did I finish? Yeah. I finished in Canada, number uh, two uh, service flying training school at, uh, in Ottawa. Were you there in the summer or the winter? I was there in the summer. Ah, it was great. It was beautiful weather. And uh, flying over the, uh, the, the lakes, the Rideau Lakes, it was great. And did you know when you graduated from there what aircraft you were going to fly? No, no. Um, I, I trained on Harvard's. And uh, when we got to England, I did a beam approach flying training and then got uh, posted to uh, Litchfield. I forgot what the number of the, the uh, what was it? 27 OTU. 27, that's right, 27 OTU. Ah, you're going to tell Litchfield. some stories about Peter? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why I took a whaff out. <laughs> Might have been you. <laughs> I won't tell. Um, uh, where, are, where, where, where was I? I went, yeah, I went to 27 OTU, and that, of course, was Wellingtons, and, you know, the twin engines. Mm and all I'd flown was Harvard's before single engine. So it started again. Mm. Yeah. All right, thanks, Peter. Um, back to you, Jack. Uh, you left uh, for the Middle East. Um, I'm assuming that once you got there, you converted to, uh, to type, and, and I'm imagining it was the uh, Bristol Bombay. Could you just uh, talk about your impressions of the Middle East when you arrived? Well, when we arrived, we were at Port Tufik, which is the south end of Suez Canal. And we built our own camp. They gave us the tents and we put our own tents up. We had to actually con construct the, the mess. They provided all the timber and stuff and there were a few uh, Egyptian boys around that did the slave work, but there was nothing there. We, the whole camp was built by the air crew. And that was in April 1941. And we sat there waiting to be posted because originally we were supposed to go to England, but they were diverted to India for a month and then into, uh, into, into Egypt. And six of us were sent to 216 Squadron Heliopolis. Now they had Vickers Valencias. Nobody knows what that is. If you look at the Handley page out the front there in the, in the museum, it's similar, similar to that. 
pilot and the observer sat out in an open cockpit, wore pith helmets, and could carry 14 people. Seven actually armed soldiers, but could carry 14 people. Its top speed was 80 miles an hour. <laughs> now, that was, I flew in that for probably six weeks, I'd imagine. We'd round the various places. Then we converted to Bristol Bombay's. Now, that was an aircraft. It was modern. Now, don't forget, all the, we young kids were all at that war. Now, we didn't know what an aeroplane was, except what we'd seen in Australia, which were Avro Anson's Tiger Moths. And it was wonderful to get on a, a big aircraft like that and had a gun on it. One. Firing out of the port, out of the starboard wing, forward. It did have a, a rear gunner compartment. But as the plane had been built by Hull and Wolf, who were shipbuilders, they decided to shift the main spar four inches forward. So as you ran out of juice flying along, it got tail heavy, and they used to dive into the deck. So you couldn't have a tail gunner. So they were taken out of combat. And before I joined the squadron, thank God, that was in April they were taken out. And we then became bomber transport, transferring wounded and replacement medical staff and medical equipment and pilots up to the front. And in terms of, um, did you have a, a, a specific crew each time or did you well, just fly with anyone? No, no. We, the actual navigator myself, we were, we were odd, odd people. We just filled in when the crews were, were short of somebody who was sick, well, we, we took their place. And I never ever flew as a crew with, in, a, in one of these aircraft. Now, the top speed was 132 miles an hour. Uh, it was frankly a coffin because it, there was no armament at all. One go gun firing out the front was useless to anybody. That's why we couldn't couldn't go into active service. But we trained the actual first people that ever became the SAS. Captain David Sterling approached our squadron commander, and he trained 36 fellows that, to be the beginning of the paratroopers, or now is termed the SAS. And he said, well, he said, well, you've got to drop at 1,000 feet. He said, no, we don't. He said, we drop at 500 feet. Now, can you imagine a fully clothed and armed paratroopers dropping at 500 feet out of an aircraft? Certainly it was from out of a static line. But they were lucky even to get the chutes open by the time they got to the ground. But they did it continuously. Now, um, you mentioned odd bods, uh, and, and everyone probably here knows that an odd bod is a Royal Australian Air Force person who serves with a Royal Air Force squadron, which you did. Were there many others, uh, many other Australians there? Well, there were six to start with in my squad, and I was shot down in January 42, and by then five, five of those had been replaced. And we had probably, oh, 16 to 20 Australians on the squadron by the, by the time uh, January, when the push in November 41, there was a lot more personnel were available for these aircraft. But we, I remember going into the Battle of City Rosega, the tank battle, there were over 300 tanks involved and we had to fly the wounded out of these tanks back to Mirza Matru. And you can imagine the horrific condition that these young men were in. And it's something I'll never forget and i never ever forget. It was shocking. Hardly anybody survived out of that, that lot, one or two maybe. All they wanted was a drink of water and they weren't allowed to have a drink of water. It was terrible flying them back. Mm. Uh, Maury, back to you. Um, you uh, finished your training and were posted to the UK and went to uh, 460 Squadron at Finbrook. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, these things come to your mind, you part of it, part of the whole thing. But when I was at Ballarat, uh, the, that's where they got the straight air gunners from. Uh, they'd about 60 would start, uh, six months of course, and after about three months, those who couldn't keep up with the moors, uh, then they had the choice of either being a tail gunner or going to ground staff, that's what we were told. Uh, but uh, something happened that I thought about it, and I thought I'd tell you that one time, uh, I went up in the old Wacker trainers and they were very, very good aircraft, very good aircraft. They couldn't get any aircraft from England hardly and uh, Air Vice Marshal Wacker designed that aircraft. But uh, I'd finished my exercise and uh, the pilot said, uh, you finished, turn around, yes. So then he let go and he looped the loop. <laughs> he looped the loop three times and I'm in the back. 
<laughs> Go on, though. That would have been an interesting experience, not expecting oh, I it, I imagine. To look, you don't know where the sky is, you don't know where the ground is. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know where you are. <laughs> so you got to Binbrook, got the 460 Binbrook. Squadron. Yes. Tell me what your first impressions were. Well, my pilot told me that it was a pretty hot squadron, a famous squadron, and uh, as the history told you, they dropped more bombs and had more casualties and more decorations than any other squadron in England. Uh, we knew it was a top squadron and we were proud to be there. And uh, we just carried on from there. How was your crew selected? Pardon? How did your crew come together? Yes. Well, that was the, how all crews were crewed up. They put you in a big hangar in, uh, at Morton and Marsh, 21 AT, Operation Training Unit, and said, right oh, make your own crews. So I was just standing there and not uh, making any move. And my navigator came up to me and said, you got a crew? No. You want to fly with us? All right. That's it. Pretty, <laughs> pretty scientific. <laughs> and and uh, the comradeship that was formed between us, we flew together for the next uh, a year. And my tail gunner was worth 20 houses and he never told us. Uh, very simple, honest bloke. Uh, pretty wild customer too. Uh -huh. And uh, he died a little while ago and uh, I'm still in touch with his wife and his family. But the comradeship, uh, is something that uh, each one who flew in Bomb McMahon tasted, and uh, you'll never taste it anywhere else. Mm. Mm. All right, thanks, uh, Murray. Back to you, Peter. Um, conversion onto the Lancaster, what was that like? Oh, the conversion onto the Lancaster was relatively easy. Uh, we'd been on the Wellingtons and fini almost finished a tour uh, on the Wellingtons, and they converted us first to the Halifax. Um, the Halifax didn't have as good a reputation as the, uh, as the Lancaster, and uh, we had a number of uh, crashes, a number of casualties while we were converting onto the Halifax, and we were very, very pleased when they took the Halifaxes away, mm -hmm. uh, away from us. And uh, then we converted quite quickly uh, onto the Lancaster. And did you enjoy flying <coughs> the aircraft? Did you enjoy flying the Lancaster? Uh, enjoyed flying the, uh, the Lancaster, quite enjoyed flying the Halifax. It was quite good to fly, but they had a few, they had problems uh, with the tail. Something was wrong with the tail, I don't know what it was. I didn't know much about aerodynamics anyway. Um, it used to stall. Uh, so two and two shots it used to stall. And stayed on that until we can, went to um, uh, transferred to Pathfinder Force. When I went to uh, 156 Squadron, they were still flying Wellingtons. And uh, my first job on 156 Squadron was to c start converting them onto the Lancaster. So, as usual, um, I converted one crew, and that crew went on to convert another crew, and so over a period of about two weeks, we converted the whole squadron from uh, Wellingtons onto Lancasters. It's pretty impressive to do it that fast, I have to say. So we're very happy. Yeah. Um, back to Jack. Yes. Um, so you're in your Bristol Bombay, and uh, you're flying over the Panzers, and what happens? Well, we were taking some pilots up to the front to, and a, a doctor and medical supplies to a little place called Masseuse, which is south of Benghazi in Libya. And we're flying at, which at we're told to travel at 3,000 feet, but it was ground mist and the pilot decided that he would come down under the ground mist to see where we were. Now imagine that. We we're 30 degrees off course as it turned out. We came down to a thousand feet under the cloud bank. We passed over this, we could see a lot of trucks on the escarpment of the, on the Mediterranean going back, going west, going east I should say. And we didn't realise that the front had moved and nobody had told us that because the Intelligence was two days behind. So we were shot down, but went over the 15th Panzer Division, which was a replacement. Of, there was probably 24 to 30 tanks, plus all the armoured vehicles and everything else there. Well, at 1,000 feet, <laughs> a lumbering aircraft doing 112 miles an hour, 
was a very easy target. Fortunately, the first shell that came through was armour piercing. It must have been because it went straight through in front of the navigator. But the point fives were the trouble. They were the little devils that exploded on, on contact. And unfortunately, we burst into flames and the first pilot lost a leg. And the second pilot brought it down in flames and I got shrapnel wounds from my leg, abdomen and shoulder. Uh, one pilot, a passenger, lost an arm. And one fellow, a no, Canadian pilot, didn't get a scratch. And we all landed, crash landed on the desert. And as I got out, I put my hand on around the door frame and it was burnt so badly burnt that it just closed up like a clenched fist in, by the end of the day. But I didn't feel anything. It was so badly burnt that the shock was there that it wasn't painful. I didn't feel a thing. But the navigator was killed. He was a fellow I trained with from uh, Australia when we, we shipped on the same, same ship going over in the Aquitania to, to Egypt. So it was a sad loss to me. There's never a day go past. But the worst thing I had to do after the war, I didn't have to, but I did do, was to go and see his mother. Now, he's an only son. He was a university graduate from Sydney. He was actually heir to a very large motor company. And I could see it in her eyes that why my son and not you? And a terrible, terrible thing to have to do. And I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody else. I, I'm sorry, but it, it was terrible. Yeah, I, I don't imagine you were on your own having to, uh, no, having to do no. that task as well. No, no, I certainly wasn't. Yeah. OK. Um, Murray, back to you and, and Binbrook. Um, you were there towards the end of the war. Could I just say something before sure. to amplify what we just heard? Uh, there was a young fellow who went on the ship with us overseas and uh, he was um, uh, shot down and killed and I knew his family. He lived in Preston. So I went along to make myself known and I'm sitting there and they're all sitting around me. Sisters, husbands, fathers, and brothers. And I'll tell you, I'd never do it again. I felt, I felt as though that uh, why should I be alive? Mm. So uh, that's what he was saying, what yeah. Chuck was saying. Common, common feeling. Mm, I'd yeah. never do it again. There was, they were started hell, and you know. Yeah. No, thank you. All right, back to Binbrook. Yeah. Your first operational flight, do you remember that? Oh, <laughs> we got there late. And we were due to go to uh, Birch's Garden. That was the last raid of the war. And somebody here who was shot down on Birch's Garden. And um, they said, uh, we're going to put a more experienced crew on. So uh, we didn't go on that. And then eight days later, they found Hitler's body in the Berlin bunker. Mm -hmm. The Russians found his body. Uh, so that uh, the dropping of the food on Holland, well, that was soda really there's no problems with that uh, they reached an agreement the Germans and the British and the Americans that they wouldn't fire on us well uh, no flak no flak but when we got back they pulled the holes in the aircraft and I often think well you can't blame a, a jury that's got a rifle of having a shot at us mm. no one would know mm, mm, mm. <laughs> all right thanks Peter back 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 to you um, Flying a Lancaster, I mean, I've flown in the Vale of York and I know what the weather's like in the UK. Flying a Lancaster at night in that sort of weather to Germany and then getting back and finding the airfield and landing must have been an extraordinary challenge in those days. Ch challenging, yes, but I mean, you know, challenges are ma made to be overcome. And uh, what all we wanted to do was to, uh, to get down and... Uh, <coughs> I left it to the navigator to tell me where I should be going. Oh, okay. And uh, so we managed to get down every time. Several times, though, we did land at, uh, at a base that was not our own. Uh, one occasion, uh, we were almost out of fuel, and we landed there. It was rather interesting because the weather was really bad and stayed bad for days. And uh, we didn't want to stay on this, on this, uh, on this base because we didn't have any clothes other than that which we, which we, um, which we were wearing. So we decided we'd go home, and we'd go home by train. 
we uh, also had um, our uh, pigeons with us. Uh, we took pigeons. You remember? Do you remember taking pigeons? No, we never took. You did, did take pigeons? No. Anyway, the, we, we we had pigeons, and the idea of taking the pigeons was that if we came down at sea, we would uh, put uh, a uh, a note on the uh, on the leg of the pigeons, giving them uh, the, what uh, the approximate position we thought we were, and send the pigeon home, and hopefully it'd get to uh, back to our own base and then they would send a, a flying boat or something from the Air Sea Rescue Service to come and pick us up. Uh, luckily, that never happened. So, but we did take our pigeons uh, on this, um, uh, on, on the train when we were coming out. I think it would have been a bit of a fall on hope with the pigeons. I think they might have been, uh, might have been uh, there in case you crashed and needed some tucker, but... Uh. <laughs> We were talking about crew selection uh, earlier on. You'd like to talk about uh, your crew selection and, and how the dynamics worked in, in amongst the crew on an operational flight? Yeah. Uh, in, in, in exactly the same way as was expressed previously, uh, we were put into a hangar, uh, a whole lot of us, a lot of air crew, and you wandered around and uh, talked to those whom you thought you would like uh, to join you. And I got uh, Bob Nielsen, um, who became my navigator and stayed with me right through, except when he was off on a course. I got Bill Copley, uh, who was the uh, wireless operator, wireless operator air gunner. He stayed with me uh, right through. I got Johnny Swain. John Swain uh, stayed with me as the rear gunner um, on 460 Squadron. Uh, Johnny was uh, engaged to a girl in Melbourne and when we decided to, well, when we were invited to go to Pathfinder Force, he, it was a purely a voluntary thing to go to Pathfinder Force. Uh, Johnny decided he wouldn't and he'd stay and finish his tour with 460, but um, unfortunately he made the wrong decision and, um, and got killed on his first trip on with the new crew. So, you know, you, you you were lucky sometimes, as I was, to get a really great crew together on that first trip around the hangar. Now that relationship with that crew lasted for years, didn't it? It lasted for years. Unfortun unfortunately, they've all died since. Um, I'm the last, uh, last remaining member of it. And, uh, uh, we stayed together, we went to each other's weddings, and uh, and uh, I became a godfather to, uh, I can't quite remember how many children, but uh, quite a few of their, uh, of their children. Mm. And I still hear from those children. All right, thanks, Peter. Jack, I'd yes. um, like to talk about the POW experience. Well, first of all, I'd just like to introduce Jim Carr, who was a prisoner of war with me in Stalag 4B in Germany. As Jim, now he was a young man, he was 19 years of age when he was shot down and he went back to Germany recently and he picked up parts of his aircraft in the, in the, in the farm that where he was shot down, just to let you know. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> I was very fortunate. When we were shot down, we were taken by ambulance to a little place called Antelat in the bottom of the Gulf of Surti and operated on by a German doctor who happened to be a Harley Street abdominal surgeon. After the First World War, part of the reparations, he decided to go to England to find a better life. Married an English girl, had two kids, and we used to go back to Germany doing consultations, and in August 1939 I went back and they wouldn't let him out. And he said to me, he said, Jack, he said, all I can do is do the best I can. Uh, he said, I'll remove part of your intestines, patch you up, but unfortunately, being wounded, you'll be passed over to the Italians. They, we only take fit men. And I travelled for four days on an open truck with three other members of our crew, and he gave me eight files of morphine, 
which is a jab yourself in the leg in the morning and at night time, and I don't remember anything about that trip, and thank goodness I don't. I arrived at Tripoli and were attended to by an Italian nurse, a lovely lady, she was in the late 60s, I would imagine, and I hadn't eaten for, for 10 days, all I'd been fed intravenously fed. And she brought a bowl of pasta for me to eat, and I couldn't eat it. And she brought, then went out and stewed a quince and put a lot of sugar in it, and I, that's the, the reason I'm here today. That decided me to, to eat. Now, as far as prison camp goes, I was in hospital for four and a half months, recovering from these wounds, which, that's fine. And I went to a camp in northern Italy called PG-57, a group you know, just near Trieste. It was an army camp, well run by the Australian New Zealand Army, it was fantastic, but the only trouble was that the rations were very poor. And unfortunately, the commander of the camp was a, a part of the uh, military police, and he decided that he would only give us one parcel, a Red Cross parcel a week, to six men. Sometimes we didn't get any, but we survived. And when I got into Germany, where Jim was in, near a little place called Mühlberg, which was sort of the apex of Berlin, Leipzig and Dresden. There were 32 acres, 35,000 prisoners, including 24,000 Russians. The rest were all from all around the world. Now those Russian boys, they got one loaf of bread to seven men for a week. We got two loaves of bread a week for about between one to three and one to four. We got some parcels, and similarly there, because the Gestapo was in charge of the camp, although he wasn't the commandant, we suffered the same fate there, but we managed to buy, with cigarettes the ration, we could buy coal, we bought wood alcohol to lace the non-alcoholic beer, we did everything we possibly could to make the buggers work harder for, to keep us there, and Jim can well countenance with this that it wasn't pleasant. But we banded together, and I can assure you that our friendship with each other is as close, if not closer, than our own families. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> now, Murray, I might jump back to you. <clears throat> um, as we said, uh, you were at Benbrook towards the end of the war. Can you just um, talk about what England was like at that time, what the people were like, what the what it felt like to be there towards the end of the war? Well, when the heat was on, we'd go down to London on leave and you catch a train and the people had been bombed out, they were sleeping in the railway um, stations. Oh, and each one had his own spot or her own spot each day, each night. Uh, that's what it was like when uh, the Jerry's were bombing London. The, all the stations were filled with people sleeping on the stations, underground. But uh, as uh, that all faded away and they didn't come over and bomb, and then uh, they didn't sleep on the railway stations after that, but there was this general atmosphere of uh, knowing that uh, the, the finish of it was, wasn't too far away, and they were breathing a sigh of relief. I could feel that. So, <laughs> on um, VE day, we travelled, we had a week's leave, or a few days' leave. So the whole station had a few days' leave. So I went down to London, and uh, I was outside Buckingham Palace, and there were about, oh, 30,000 people there, all singing out, we want the king, we want the king. And he had only been out about five minutes before, and... Um, uh, that was uh, <laughs> didn't worry me too much, <laughs> but uh, there was a general feeling that uh, it was wasn't too far away the surrender, and uh, a great feeling of relief, a great feeling of relief. And I guess you were pretty keen to get home. Well, they called for volunteers for the Tiger Force. Um, and my crew volunteered, so I thought I'd better too. And that was to bomb Japan, fly the aircraft out to Okinawa. And uh, I found out later that they were going back through America, flying that way. Uh, and um, 
I looked at the map one day, it's 500 miles from Okinawa to Japan, and if you were shot up, nearly two engines going, and you ditched in that ocean, you didn't have a chance. But uh, then things were rather uh, unsettled. Uh, there wasn't much enthusiasm. Nobody tried too hard to with your training. You were flying all the time. Uh, but they knew something was going on. And uh, then when the atom bomb was dropped, that was the finish. All righty. Thank you. Peter, back to you, um, Pathfinders. Um, um, I guess we could perhaps get your views on area bombing, precision bombing, Pathfinders, uh, what was involved in being a Pathfinder. I mean, I think you spent a lot more time over the target than most, probably. Um, the, the, the purpose of Pathfinders was to direct the main force into the right place to bomb. You know, Bomber Command had been going for quite a long time before it made any discernible difference to the war effort, uh, mainly because uh, the uh, crews were not thoroughly trained. Uh, they were put off by the weather. They were put off by uh, the anti-aircraft fire and they were put off by fighters. So some means had to be devised to stop uh, or to improve the results and that was the reason for the formation of uh, Pathfinder Force under the command of an Australian, uh, DCT Bennett. And uh, DCT Bennett got together five squadrons to start with. Squadron of Mosquitoes, squadron of, uh, two squadrons of Lancasters, one of Halifaxes and one of Stirlings. And um, we uh, were given uh, some additional training and the crews that were put, came to Pathfinder Force had all been with main force for some time. And so uh, it was our job to uh, find the target, identify the target, uh, and to maintain uh, the position of the bombing uh, through the raid. And uh, so uh, there were aircraft uh, pathfinders that went in and uh, made sure that the target that they were bombing was the right one and uh, they uh, dropped uh, flares and on top of the flares the main force came in and the job the main force job was to bomb on those flares they were not supposed to uh, make their own decisions as to where they bombed now Pretty dangerous stuff. Um, did you think about it, or did you just do it? No, no more dangerous than anyone else's. Pro probably exposed a little longer, though. Well, uh, you 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 were exposed by yourself for a while until you until you dropped your you know dropped your flares. Um, but uh, having done your job, you got the hell out of it. <laughs> okay. uh, Jack, back to. Back to you. You can have a word if you yes, like. Yes, we appreciate it, didn't we, Jim? We used to see the, the, see the flares go off. They were going on Falkenberg Railway Yards. The, path, the Pathfinder boys had come in, and with, after them, the bombing force had come through. It was spectacular to watch five miles away, but not, I wouldn't like to be here down there. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, back to your POW days. Um, at, at the end of the war, the Russians came along. Well, my period of POW is three years, three weeks, and th three months and three weeks, as Chris said. Now, the end of the war came for us. Actually, we were recaptured by the Russians on the 24th of April, 1945. We weren't released, we were recaptured. Our basis of food was we could walk past the Russian sacks of oats or barley or whatever they had, and you could put your hand in, and that was your ration for the day. That didn't suit us at all. 
because we're used to having some sort of food, even from the Germans. We did have a little bit of bread, but the Russians, you must look at it this way, that the Russians were treated the Germans exactly as the Germans had treated them, and it was unfortunate. 60,000 Russians died in our camp alone. Now, that's incredible. But the food was enough to subsist on. And as Jimmy will, will vouch for this, the Red Cross parcel saved our lives. There's undoubtedly no, no doubt about that whatsoever. Otherwise, we'd have been like the Jap boys. We'd have been starving to death. Thanks, Granny. And the Russians themselves, the once Russians, they... The uh, Russians themselves... Now, I befriended a colonel in the Russian army. He, used to, he went to Sandhurst in England and officer training, and he, he used to watch us play cricket. We had a cricket pitch made up, and we Australia worse than New Zealand, England, the whole bit went on. And uh, he used to sit and watch us, and he'd say, you know, Jack, we'll never get back home. I said, what do you mean? He said, we've seen too much. We've seen how the other half live. <laughs> He said, well, none of us will get home. And they didn't get home. The BBC put out a, a more many years ago, and the, they traced the only seven out of our camp ever got back to Moscow. Now, terrible. Now, I'm uh, conscious sorry, of time. Uh, sorry, Chris. Yep. I went recently to St. Petersburg and saw their museum there. Now, they lost 900,000 people during the war. 900,000 dead out of St. Petersburg alone. Their, their losses were f f terrific. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I'm conscious of time. We could obviously go on for the rest of the afternoon, um, but, uh, but we, we do have to curtail it there and open up for some questions. But before we do that, I'd just like to get from, from each of you perhaps a, a last comment about what Bomber Command meant to you, what the war meant to you, if you're comfortable answering that. Maureen. Well, like all of us, we didn't know really what was going on. We just did what we were told. And uh, I remember Jesse James, he crewed up with us on the Tiger Force, and he told us that he was on Dresden, the bomb aimer on Dresden. And he told us that uh, the squadron refused to fly. The squadron refused to fly. They said it was an undefended target, had no military importance, and uh, they refused to fly. They told then the real reason for it. And this is what he told us, that um, they knew uh, the British and Americans and the Russians, the British and Americans knew that Russia was going to be pretty hard to handle. They agreed to the division of Europe but they never expected the Russia to stick to this. And this is what they were told at briefing, that uh, if you don't play ball, you'll cop it from Bomber Command. And Russia never had a Bomber Command because Russia was all the time appealing to Churchill to bomb more of the Eastern German targets to make it easier for them to advance. So uh, I rang up the sun one day. I said to them, look, here's a chance that you can find out what happened at that briefing day. When they were told the real reason, they went and did it. Uh, the reporter laughed at me. He didn't want to know. All right, thanks, Murray. Peter. What, what did being in Bomber Command mean well, for me? Well, just, just some last thoughts about Bomber Command and the war and, you know. Well, being in Bomber Command gave me an opportunity to give, give, give back to the Germans and the Italians what they had done to the force, the non-Nazi and fascist forces in their own country. And of course, uh, being Jewish, it gave me an opportunity to give back to the Germans what they had done to my co-religionists, and that was a source of very great satisfaction to me. Thanks, Peter. Jack? Well, I can vouch for Murray's words about bombing Dresden. One of our guards was, we, 
but his name was Smith, Smith. And he lost his entire family in one of those raids. 16 members of his family. He's left, and he was an old and bold from the First World War. Now, as far as, from my experience of the war, it was a great adventure to start with, but we realised that we were fighting for mankind against a very, 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 very arrogant and very, very good armed force in Germany. Italy wasn't so bad, but Germany, we knew that they were, they were tough. But the greatest thing that I earned from that war was tolerance. Absolutely tolerance. I welcome all these migrants that come here today. I'm very happy about it. I'm pleased to see them here. Thank you very much.